The Order of Skull and Bones is one of the world's most secret societies. Started at Yale in 1832, the Order's list of members has included prominent figures embedded within everything from CIA to education to medicine to the Superior Court and, of course, presidents and politicians like William Howard Taft, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, and John Kerry. Known for their terrifying, satanic, and sexually explicit initiation rituals, members of the Skull and Bones are sworn to secrecy. So that's where they have the ceremonies in the, the outdoor part of it. Part of it was indoor, so we only got to see the outdoor part. Right. We only got to and, and to listen to the outdoor part. God only knows what went on indoors. And what did you hear? What, what was it? You know, you managed to get this unique. Oh, it was disgusting. It was gross. I mean, they were pretending to murder people. And what was the tone of it, though? Was it was it jokey? Or was it quite no, it wasn't jokey at all. It was it was sick. It's about the only thing to describe it. It was sick. What you're hearing is the first recording ever made of the Skull and Bones initiation ceremony. It has never been broadcast before. But what is the function of the order, and how does it affect politics in the world today? In Anthony C. Sutton's 1983 book, America's Secret Establishment, An Introduction to the Order of Skull and Bones, Sutton states, Historically, operations of the order have concentrated on society, how to change society in a specific manner towards a specific goal, a new world order. We know the elements in society that will have to be changed in order to bring about this new world order. We can then examine the order's actions in this context. He goes on to outline 12 key elements. Education, how the population of the future will behave. Money, the means of holding wealth and exchanging goods. Law, the authority to enforce the will of the state. A world law and a world court is needed for a world state. Politics, the direction of the state. Economy, the creation of wealth. History, what people believe happened in the past. Psychology, the means of controlling how people think. Philanthropy, so that people think well of the controllers. Medicine, the power over health, life, and death. Religion, people's spiritual beliefs, the spur to action for many. Media, what people know and learn about current events. Continuity, the power to appoint who follows in your footsteps. In America's Secret Establishment, Anthony C. Sutton writes, Probably the most difficult task in this work will be to get across to the reader what is really an elementary observation, that the objective of the order is neither left nor right, Left and right are artificial devices to bring about change, and the extremes of political left and political right are vital elements in a process of controlled change. The answer to this seeming political puzzle lies in Hegelian logic. Remember that both Marx and Hitler, the extremes of left and right, presented as textbook enemies, evolved out of the same philosophical system, Hegelianism. That brings screams of intellectual anguish from Marxists and Nazis, but is well known to any student of political systems. The dialectical process did not originate with Marx, as Marxists claim, but with Fichte and Hegel in late 18th and early 19th century Germany. In the dialectical process, a clash of opposites brings about a synthesis. For example, a clash of political left and a political right brings about another political system a synthesis of the two, neither left nor right. This conflict of opposites is essential to bring about change. He goes on to say, furthermore, for Hegel and systems based on Hegel, the state is absolute. The state requires complete obedience from the individual citizen. An individual does not exist for himself in these so-called organic systems, but only to perform a role in the operation of the state. He finds freedom only in obedience to the state. There was no freedom in Hitler's Germany. There is no freedom for the individual under Marxism. Neither will there be in the New World Order. And if it sounds like George Orwell's 1984, it is. Here's author Anthony C. Sutton with a more detailed explanation.
The method they use is that of the Hegelian dialectic. Thesis played against antithesis leads to a synthesis. In other words, for Hegel, for history to make progress, you have to have conflict. And when you look at the key people in the order, you will find that they generate conflict. So Bush and Harriman politically are conflicting. Um, Coffin and Buckley, although part of the same order, are in public conflicting with one another because conflict leads to the new synthesis. One can only deduce at this point from the operations of these men as individuals and working together. Um, they want to acquire power above all. Power Political to do what? power. As you look at their actions, the political power is to bring about what they call a new world order, which is a one world. But they use the Hegelian techniques. We know enough about Hegel to know that not only does this mean the dialectic process, the creation of conflict, but it also means that individuals such as you and I, or anybody watching this program, will be cogs in the state, that we have no individual rights, our rights for, rights for Hegel, individual rights for Hegel come about through obedience to the state. Uh, we see it in the educational process, which we'll probably talk about later, that we have adopted what I call a Hegelian system of education, which is not to bring out your innate talents, but to prepare you to be an individual cog in the state. So today you've got two men who are supposedly in politics in opposition. Bush and Harriman, actually the members of the same secret society, and Bush's father was not only a member, he was a partner in the, what was then Harriman and Company, which later became Burn Brothers Harriman. So behind the scenes, and this is something you don't see until you investigate it, people who appear to be in opposition politically or financially or industrially or in many ways uh, are working together. Uh, in other words, um, at that level, politics disappears and people often wonder why does a Democrat join a Republican administration? If you check back, you'll find out there's not as a member of the order. I don't know about you, but I seem to remember a Democrat turned Republican in a recent political election. In many cases, I probably identify more as a Democrat. It's the first campaign attack ad to take aim at Donald Trump, using his past words of support for the Democrats to skewer him. Hillary Clinton, I think, is a terrific woman. I mean, I'm a little biased because I've known her for years. I think she really works hard, and I think she does a good job. Of course, we know that Donald Trump was a registered Democrat from August 2001 through September 2009. And what an odd turn of events that Trump ended up a Republican pitted against his friend and terrific woman, Democrat Hillary Clinton, in some of the best reality television the world has ever seen in the 2016 presidential election. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Yeah, because you'd be in jail. Secretary Clinton. <laughs> Whether or not immediate ties to the order are apparent, this is how the political system functions. Two opposing forces of the dialectic to keep you busy, divided, and arguing over bullshit that ultimately serves the elite agenda and not yours. You establish one side, then you establish the other side, then you bring them into conflict, then you manage that conflict. So you establish Soviet Union, you establish Hitler, you bring them into conflict, World War II. By managing the conflict, you can control the next decade or so. And as I mentioned, um, we built up the Soviet Union. We're building up the China today, communist China. We're even going to send the military technology. So by 1990-2000, we've established the two sides. We bring them into conflict. Now tell me, why does Reagan go along with these agreements with Red China, which he just did, to supply this technology? He's not a member of the order. Why does he respond to its stimuli? Because you've got a group within the administration who are members, who are connected with the order. When you get a group quite capable men working together, they can wear down opposition, they can erode opposition because they're all kind of marching in step. If you get three men marching in step, they can do more than 20 men marching to their own step. Don't make my point here. Mm -hmm. And within the order, for example, or within the administration, you've got, for example, Mr. Bush. Um, and the people around Mr. Bush, Mr. Baker, Chief of Staff in the White House. 
and gradually have seen the weeding out of those individuals who are independent. They're being either they've either resigned or they've been moved out to other departments. So, in effect, the order has taken over very gradually, very carefully, without any fanfare. But you need the you need the so-called <laughs> conflict between the two to keep people focusing. Look, they keep you looking over there. You know, capitalism versus communism. You know, that makes a nice little picture. You know, you get books on it and films on it. Uh, capitalism versus communism. That's not where the action is. The action is over here. I have never seen anything in the literature which um, um, leads me to believe that they have our individual rights in their hearts. What I do see in the literature and in the documents is a, a, um, a ruthless drive to acquire power for themselves and to help each other because this is one of the tenets of the order that if you have three men coming before you for a job the preference absolutely goes to your brother in the order it remains secret for 150 years because these people are under an oath not to talk about it I understand that a member of the order may not remain in the room if it comes under discussion. Mr. President, are you a member of Skull and Bones? You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the record. Number 322? <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh... You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322? Secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets, Tim, but one thing is not a secret. I disagree with this president's direction that he's taking the country. We can do a better job. At its roots, the political system is a contrived machine constructed in order to suppress your rights and keep you working as a cog within the Hegelian dialectic. There will always be some new asshole in a suit promising hope and change, but will ultimately fail to deliver these things due to the fact that only puppets of the state will be allowed to flourish under those at the top who are pulling the strings. And make no mistake, Skull and Bones is only one faction within the web of secret societies that control the direction of the world. Every time you vote, you participate in your own enslavement. The most unfortunate thing to me is that when the people have coming at them from all directions, uh, this momentum of the order, uh, they turn and espouse the order or they let these people, or have in the past, become their idols, accept that they are an elite, accept that fact that they are superior, accept the projection from them to the people that they're superior. Yes. And uh, today you will find fr uh, people agreeing with the limitation of freedom yes. uh, in various sectors of this country. For I think purposes. that's a very unfortunate part of our society that uh, too many people are willing to abandon freedom for security, or what they see as security. You can get secured in a Siberian gulag, but uh, you can get uh, you know, freedom in, a, in Hitler's concentration camp. You know, but, uh, too many people are willing to, um, to um, give up freedom for security.